city of asylum. Barbara. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Tonight, I'm honored to be able to talk with Russian writer Dmitry Bikov, who's here in Ithaca for this year as a fellow of the Open Society University Network at Cornell University's Institute for European Studies and the Anaudi Center, a division of Global Cornell. The Institute and Ithaca City of Asylum are co-sponsoring Dimitri's visit as well as participating in tonight's event. Um, we'll be talking with Dimitri for about a half an hour and then he's happy to receive questions from you during the next half hour. Uh, I will let you know when we begin and just put your virtual hand up and you'll appear on screen and we'll call on as many people as we can. Dmitry Bikov is a Russian poet, novelist, literary critic, satirist, journalist, teacher, and public intellectual who has published more than 80 books and who has won seven international awards. Among his publications are a biography of Boris Pasternak and another of Maxim Gorky. A popular lecturer, he has been an outspoken critic of the Putin regime, regime and has been banned from teaching and speaking on state media. In 2019, Dmitry fell ill while traveling and spent five days in a coma. Subsequent investigation indicated clear parallels to the later poisoning of dissident Alexei Navalny. Dmitry has previously taught for several semesters at US universities, including Princeton and UCLA, as well as lectured across the US. This time, this visit is somewhat different as his arrival a month ago coincided exactly with the Russian army's invasion of Ukraine. This gives us a unique opportunity to address the intersection of writing and freedom of expression with the current political crisis. Dmitry, can you speak about for a bit about when you were first ex restricted from teaching and from appearing on the media? Well, in 2014, when the annexion of Crimea happened, uh, I was uh, kindly supposed to leave the University of International Relationships because otherwise, uh, otherwise I would be fired from there, which would be not so flatter for my reputation. And I preferred to go on my own wish, or as, as, as I say usually, by the own wish of my chief. Then I was banned in Moscow University, which was my alma mater. I was reading there the course on history of Russian journalism. You know that sometimes Russian journalism helped Russian literature when it wasn't able to explain some principally new notions and things. For example, like Russian xenophobia, which appeared to be so cruel just in the beginning of uh, 20th century, for example, the process of Baileys and so on. Russian journalists like Karolenka were writing except for Russian writers because writers couldn't explain fascism. It was something principally new. You know that journalism doesn't explain, it only describes. And so that was the course of Russian journalism as a soft replacement for really great literature. You know that most of Russian great events like October Revolution, for example, Great Patriotic Wars, the Second World War, they are still not described in literature because literature doesn't have such instruments. Journalism replaced writers and described it. Maybe we'll survive this situation and maybe we'll get explanations sometimes. This course also was banned and the Dean of the faculty told me uh, with the grief in her soft voice, that she really feels sorry for the course and for students, but they can't pay me anymore and I couldn't work for free. Then I was banned in Moscow Pedagogical Institute uh, where I was teaching methodics, methodics of teaching. Uh, I think uh, nobody must feel uh, himself a victim as Brodsky said, why not? objects of history, but we try to be subjects. And so I prefer not to lament, but I can enumerate some works which I lost uh, and it was really very painful because for example, I was banned on all the federal channels of TV and all the channels of radio except Echo of Moscow, which is also banned now. Yes. Now, 
but I think you've mentioned that the government restriction on you does not in a way extend to book censorship. Is that correct? Your books have not been censored? Exactly. You can write everything you want because you know, like all of um, like all of members of secret policy, they don't respect their population. You know that secret policy has a very good experience of cracking people, of torturing them. And surely that's a lousy vision when you torture somebody and the person is screaming. And so they don't respect us because they are quite sure, uh, as Fazil Iskander said, our great writer, there are some people who manage not to be cracked, but it means only that the tortures were too weak. Mm -hmm. They think this way. So they don't respect the reader, they don't respect their population. And they're sure that nobody is reading all these books. You can write everything you like. That's the reason Orwell is not banned still, and Bradbury and so on, Kafka and so on. And we also can write everything. That's the reason that some of my novels uh, maybe seem to be too actual, too connect, too strongly, strictly connected with the current reality. But that was my only way to say something about happening things. Right. Um, what does it mean for you to dissent, to be in that position, whether at home or abroad? What are the consequences of speaking out for you? Well, the only consequences is called bullying, you know, the usual thing in schools, for example, mm -hmm. when you are called the enemy of people, you are practically declared to be out of law. They can do everything with you and say that that was the anger of people. Uh, for example, if you are beaten by somebody or even killed by somebody like him, so they call it just a revenge from people who are true patriots. That's normal because you were a challenge for them. And so um, the only consequences in my case was that I became more popular, you know, in the country where practically uh, 10, maybe 12 public intellectuals are still free. Uh, here you stand like a lonely tree on the white valley covered by snow, and you are seen from every side. That's normal, and that makes you not only um, somehow humiliated, but it makes you also very popular. And uh, tens and hundreds of people who met me just in Moscow metro and in the street of Russian cities were uh, coming closer and whispering, I am with you, but only whispering, which was also very pleasant. Mm -hmm. in, in such a mysterious way, uh, it flatters. I should yeah, say. I hear you. Um, at this particular historical moment, what, what is the status of most of your friends and colleagues who are writers? Are they still in Russia? Uh, no, most of them exiled. Uh, they managed to run away somehow, maybe in last moment, like me, for example, because I appeared in New York on 20th of February, and four days later, it all began. It was evident. We could predict it. It was so predictable that in uh, 2005, I predicted all the situation in my novel, Living Souls. Right. Uh, this war and everything which happened later and even the final of it. Uh, but, you know, uh, even if something is predicted, it's very difficult. It's, very, it's really a strong challenge to change your life and your life so drastically, just to change the place of life and work. Uh, by the way, you know, in Russia now, it is forbidden strictly to take some money with you. You can take only $10,000. And so uh, it's forbidden for many officers of services, of secret services, to leave the country. All the government has no right to leave the country. They all are uh, Putin's, um, uh, I should say, maybe, maybe that's a strong word. But they're his prisoners. Uh, it was their free will, sure. Uh, it was their choice. But they have practically no right to leave the country. All the officers of police, all the uh, members of government, and even the economists of some high level. 
Uh, they are just his prisoners, and I think they dislike it. But most of free intellectuals left the country. Uh, some of them are in Europe, some in Latin America. Very few are in the United States because getting visa was a big problem. And thanks, Carnell, and most of all, thanks, Ukraine, who gave me this visa, mm -hmm. uh, knowing that I belong to the enemy state. Yes, you actually had to go to Kyiv, didn't you? Right, in order to get the visa. I had to go to Kyiv twice, and that was a brilliant possibility to see most of my friends. I don't want to see that that was my last time in Kyiv, but we'll never see Kyiv anymore as it was before the war. You know, it's partly destroyed. And it's very horrifying, really very horrible to think that Russians destroyed the capital of all Russian cities, the yeah. first of them. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, that besides the recent anti-war rallies in Russia, there are certain individuals in the public eye there who have spoken out. The Channel One worker, who has since left her position at the television station. Uh, the prima ballerina, Smirnova, who's leaving the Russian Bolshoi, uh, the Moscow Ballet. I'm, I'm wondering, for writers and artists in Russia, what do you believe could be an effective response to the invasion of Ukraine, if anything. Barbara, it's really very unpleasant to say that there can be no effective answer. Mm -hmm. When you are hostage, uh, when you are captured, the only thing you can do is screaming and lamenting. Uh, it looks, uh, I must say, it looks um, very lousy. Even those marshes, you know, Sherwood Anderson's novel, Marching On, Marching Men, which described all those demonstrations in Rocky America in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, they also were useless because, as Anderson said, the aim of marching is marching. We march nowhere. Yeah. Uh, I know this novel very well because my son's name is Sherwood, uh, and that was uh, Katya's choice, the choice of my wife, who was working over Anderson's creations in her university. So this novel describes our situation quite evidently, Martian men, but Martian to nowhere. Uh, there's no effective protest against, maybe, against some political ex um, investigations about corruption. But as for me, corruption is not such a crime. Uh, if you do something good for the country, uh, God bless you, steal everything, but do something. Uh, Putin's main guilt is that um, he is generally not a worker, not a thinker. He is just the officer and the officer of a very low grade. He has no habit of thinking. And that's the reason that he never directed the country. He was only keeping his power. You can't oppose anything to it because only officers of secret policy uh, now direct Russia into abyss. And they have no other direction, you know, because the only, um, maybe the only way of ruling is repressions, repressions which strengthen with every day. Yes. Um, the in Russia, very especially these weeks, so little free press remains. Uh, I think it was just about three weeks ago that the Russian independent news channel Rain shut down after being threatened by the government, and it had been going for ten years. And at one point, I believe you yourself had a TV cable program, yes. Nostalgia, that was very popular with the Ukrainians. Could you talk a bit about that? You know, uh, this was my favorite job. The title of the program was The Pulp of Past uh, or The Pulp of Time. We were analyzing and mesmerizing somehow the dead body of Soviet Union. Hmm. We all understood, and uh, that's principle for me, that the last years of Soviet Union were much better than nowadays reality. Because uh, in 70s, Russia survived again a kind of silver age a kind of great era of modernism. Just remember what great artists and great writers were working in Russia at that moment. 
Tarkovsky and his father, Strugatsky and his brother, Efremov and his son, uh, great dynasties, great writers like Trifonov, Aksyonov, Tabakov, and so on. Uh, all Russian culture now doesn't coast, doesn't coast the 10th part of that great renaissance. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we are just uh, trying to understand how was it possible, uh, how it happened that in a declining empire, which was ruled by uh, some old fools, I'm sorry, this great art could flourish. How it happened? Um, most of my spectators were Russians and Ukrainians, uh, the biggest republic of ex-USSR. Uh, they called me in the fear, and we were discussing our past and memorizing it and recalling it. And for example, there were two old women uh, of old Soviet intelligentsia, two teachers, one from Donetsk and another from Kiev. There was no opposition between them, you know. All Ukraine was united and all those screaming about uh, uh, poor Donetsk, which was destroyed. You know, most of Donetsk uh, was very loyal to Ukraine. And so um, when I visited Kiev, they were going on all my meetings and all my poetic readings and they always brought me something. They couldn't bring anything expensive. They brought just some toys for Sherwood or some coats of wool made by themselves. Mm. And they keep it all. And now, you know, I'm afraid, just afraid to call them because I have nothing to say. They, those old women were under Russian bombs and they don't know what to tell them, how to explain it. Uh, one of them was Anne, another was Galina. I remember them very well. Maybe they're watching us even now because you know that internet in Kiev is free. Yes. And I can say, well, you know, uh, during my first speech in Kiev in uh, 2014 after Crimea, when I visited for the first time, I said, only, uh, I'm sorry, forgive me. Everything I can say is only forgive me. I have no rehabilitations for myself and no explanations. Only forgive me, not us, but me, because maybe I could stop it, but I didn't find such words which could stop them. Yes. Uh, and I can only repeat it. You know, it's really very difficult for me to speak about this because my favorite reader always was the representative of old Russian intelligentsia. I am son of old Russian teacher and maybe uh, that's your sad happiness that she uh, died a year before. Mm. By the way, I couldn't leave her in Moscow. Mm. Now I can do it. Yeah, yes. Do you think uh, the Ukrainian's response to the Russian aggression is a model and inspiration for Russians to be more resistant, to be less helpless? Well, um, a good and complicated question. You know, on the island Ifaluk, which is described in Psychologia, there are some strange emotions which are much more complicated than our usual feelings. For example, the mixture of inspiration, uh, happiness, and despair. They call it fago. Uh, you feel it when you get a very strong shock after some great event. For example, after the victory in war. You feel grief, sure, because uh, this grief is connected with all the dead. You remember them. You are happy that you won. And then you are shocked because you don't understand how mankind could transform this way. And so I think Ukrainians have a very strange mixture of emotions. Sure, the first one is hatred and revenge because they're insulted, insulted deeply. Mm -hmm. uh, the second is happiness that they're a united nation, a European nation. Mm -hmm. And the third is doubt, the great doubt, because they have no clear evidence of future. They understand that now they're responsible for whole Europe, I should say. Maybe they're leaders of Europe, and that's a great responsibility. Uh, maybe I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be too politically correct, and I'm sorry, but some part of Europe betrayed Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine has got not all this help it needed. 
And some of them even uh, are saying that, yeah, there, everything, is, um, everything is not as clear. There are some Nazis, sure. Every population and every country has its Nazis, and more than this, it's criminals. But nevertheless, in Ukraine, Nazis are really very few, much more rare than in Russia. What are very and, few, sorry? Uh, Nazis. Nazism in Ukraine Nazis, is very yes. rare. Uh, yes, rare. which is you what can't you're... find the two Nazis. Some sometimes they call uh, radical nationalists such person like the third sector and so on, but most of them are not Nazis. And so I must say that now uh, Ukrainians feel the horrifying, the terrible responsibility uh, in front of the face of Europe because they have to lead it. And you know that's not such a troop which is simple to lead. They are not ready to, to fight. Mm -hmm. And they don't have some strong and strict foundation uh, of huge developments in their hearts. No philosophy, no understanding of life, uh, many parasites who don't work at all. Uh, Europe nowadays is not uh, that frontier of mankind as it has been, for example, in Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. With this, with this intense awareness, um, uh, the existing co co restrictions in Russia are work. They work against creativity and productivity, and now this destructive war, threatening so many, creating constant, endlessly changing upheaval. I want to turn the question to you and to others who are writers. How do you find it to write? How can you write now? Well, you know that Adorno's question, uh, how can you write poems after Asvensum? Uh, really, in the so-called negative dialectics in his most famous work, he asks another question. He says, it's shameful to live after Asvensum, not to write, but to live, to survive. Mm -hmm. Writing is not shameful. You know, um, I would say the amount of materia in the world is constant. And if you strengthen, strengthen somehow the amount of harmony, you can, uh, for example, leave the more uh, the narrow uh, the narrow space for evil. If you try to write more, it means that your poems will replace evil. It will take place of evil. And that's the reason that most of Russians, of Russian poets now, write so much, and Ukrainians also. For example, Alia Haitlina, who is a very great poet, I must say, she lives in Germany, but she writes Russian. She writes a verse every day. She says, it's my service, I'm recruited. And her poems are just like prayers. Uh, because she prays for peace, and she also works as a volunteer. But uh, I write also every day, because I think that my writing replaces all this amount of lie, all this amount of uh, cruel and um, wrong words, which are produced by Russian power. I try to replace them, and that's the only thing I can do. And maybe, uh, by the way, in my poem after Adorno, which was published uh, three years ago, I was just explaining that we shouldn't be too shy and awkward about writing. It's the best thing a man can do, a person can do. Thank you, thank you. I think that is a perhaps a good place to pause. Um, and maybe we could turn now to asking the audience to participate. The audience, yeah, if they have some questions. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you. Oh. If you could put your hand up, yes. Uh, actually, my friend Oleg is, <laughs> is there coming, I hope, from New York. Oleg, hi. Dimitri, uh, what is your question? Sound? Turn your sound on. Thank you. We listen, yeah. We hear you. We can hear you now. No. Nope. 
No, Oleg, no. Oh, unmute yourself, Oleg, please. Again. What about now? Yeah, that's good. Yes, Alex, now we're here. There you go. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, Dmitry, um, so what, when do you think, um, what could Russian people do about Putin throughout his 20 plus years? Like, was there a point of no return at some point that when people just became complacent and then just decided, you know, whatever, whatever you do, it's not going to work anyway, like all these elections and voting. Um, when did that happen? I mean, because at some point there was, there was Bolotnaya, uh, there was a lot of arrests and people still was, were trying to do something. And, uh, and then we see uh, 2020, he pushed that new constitution and it's like there was no resistance whatsoever. No, no, that wasn't turn point, you know. You surely remember Henry James, the turn of the screw. The turn of the screw happened in 2011. Uh, I remember it very well because it was the start of my political activities. You know, I came to a meeting as a journalist and one policeman who recognized me by TV asked, do you want to say something? And I went on tribune and began to speak. That was the strange beginning of my political activities. Uh, the, turn point, which is really the most principal moment, the point of the turn or the wrong turn, you know, this franchise. It happened in 2011 when Putin decided to go back to power. If he went away uh, in 2008, giving his place to Medvedev, everything could be changed. But you know, when a person spends 12 years in power or 16 years in power, he becomes crazy automatically. That's not somatic. That's not his physical problem. That's only the problem that he has no opposition and no advisors. Nobody can stop him. I'm quite sure that, for example, if I spent in power even four years, I've got really crazy. It's very simple because, you know, in Russian pyramid, uh, in Russian vertical system of power, there is no such person which can give you an advice or can stop you somehow. Somehow except conspiracy and you know conspiracy is no good for the country. So the turn point happened during those meetings in autumn of 2011. There was the last splash of Russian political activities. It was crushed roughly by the power and after it, everything was much, much weaker. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another question? David Gaspari. Hi, I'm curious. Hi, Hi David. David. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Hi, Dimitri. David was the uh, first person to meet me in Ithaca. I'll never forget it. <laughs> So practically every day now in the news, we hear that Navalny has sent out a tweet. How does that happen? He's in jail. Navalny is a good friend of mine. Um, and when he decided to be back, I also felt a very strange mixture, a very strange mixture of emotions. First of all, I was happy. Because you are always happy when somebody um, creates the great idea or acts like a hero. It's very pleasant to see a hero uh, because you can see that it was not a lie about all these tales about princes and dragons. Sometimes there are some brave knights, there are some Lancelots who are ready uh, to fight against dragons. And so it makes you also great somehow. It makes you feeling that you participate the great event. And when Navalny said he is back, I was happy. That was the first moment. The second was usual shame because I felt that I wouldn't be able to do something like this. And sure, I would stay in Germany comforting and consoling myself like always that I would be more useful being free. 
But sometimes being useful is the worst version. Sometimes you shouldn't be useful. Sometimes you should be heroic. Uh, you must become a heroic victim. And the third moment was, I had a, a very weak doubt, a very small doubt that he wouldn't be arrested, you know, because when you see a hero, sometimes you are afraid to touch him. Like for example, to touch the fire. Uh, but they uh, appeared to be uh, such cowards, which preferred to look like cowards, and they arrested him. I'm sure that there are two uh, well-known prisoners in Russia. Putin is prisoner of Kremlin, and Navalny is prison, uh, prisoner of Pokrov, where he sits. I'm sure that Navalny would be released. Navalny would go away from his prison. Putin will never go away from his prison till he is alive. And so I feel, uh, maybe I feel more respect to Navalny, sure. And no sorry for Putin, no grief for Putin. I think there was also that other question was, how does he, how does he text from, how does he send messages from prison? What freedom does he have? Um, you know that during his first, um, his first imprisonment, he had right to see his wife. And she was given his notes and writing them and giving them to journalists. Now he is forbidden to meet his wife. I don't know how he will manage and how he will cope with this. But maybe there are some journalists which are allowed to see him sometimes. Or maybe he has some special channels. You know that Russia in such a complicated country, we have the great experience of underground. Uh, we never had uh, such a law, uh, such a loyal political reality. Everything was happening in deep underground and we have a very good experience of creating uh, hidden connections. Other channels, good. Growing tunnels, I should say. Like Wysotsky said, we, are, we must create tunnels. Not corridors, <laughs> but tunnels. Yeah, and maybe Navalny is a very um, good master in underground struggle. Event. Good. We have many questions here. The next one, I'd like to call on Leonid Rabinovich. Uh, yes, hi. Hi. Uh, you know, I. it's a strange that to Russian people should communicate in English, but okay, <laughs> I will continue in English. Pleasant and prestigious. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have a sad question. Uh, what do you think about Russian people? It looks like we underestimate the number of Russians who support Putin. And I want to ask if you can comment this uh, fair. Well, I won't say that number and the amount of Russians who support Putin is really small. No, it's big enough. And it can be explained. Putin is maybe the last hook which hangs Russia over the abyss. They are quite right saying that after Putin and without Putin, there would be no Russia. Russia would be recreated. Russia would be changed radically. And most of people are really connected to their past and they're panically afraid of future. You know, future is the most forbidden, the most banned topic now in Russia. There can be no projects of Russia, uh, for example, because federalism is banned. And for example, even questioning about the system of governing after Putin is also banned. You can discuss your future, it's closed. People are afraid of anything new. They uh, remember very well the shock of 90s and they don't want to repeat it. They are connected strongly with their old movies, their old anecdotes, and their experience of underground opposition. They're not ready to fight. They're not ready to work seriously. They want to stay in their cozy and lousy world, the world of late uh, Soviets. And most of them are quite sure that after Putin, their life would be changed. They still don't understand. They just didn't see that Putin have led them to the abyss. It happened already. 
They still don't understand it because the consequences of sanctions are not as visible as, for example, they're visible for us. Most of people are sure that sanctions, is something for the power, not for them, that they wouldn't oppose it. They will oppose it very soon. They'll face it. Uh, by the way, you know that life of most Russians is really very modest. Uh, they never had any vanity, any glamorous life. They never saw it. Their usual food is potatoes and pickles, and they're sure it's enough. Most of them, just remember this number, 70% uh, of Russians never had foreign passport, never left the country. They have no experience of foreign life. And they are quite sure that Europe is full only of lesbians. They see that there is no progress. They call it gay Europa. <laughs> uh, th this is tragic, uh, but uh, but funny also. Everything in Russia is funny now. Mm. So um, the problem is that their panical fear in front of future and in front of real life is so childish, so infantile. Uh, Russia is the country of angry children. That's all, and they're afraid that their old teacher will leave them alone in the cold wind of reality. That's the reason he is supported by masses. But the quality of those masses is disparating. Thank you. Uh, Elena, are you there? I was going to call on Elena next. Vizuay, is it me? Yes. Hey, yeah. hi. Vizuay, hi. <laughs> it's mostly not, not, uh, not a question, but kind of an expression uh, to Dmitri. Uh, I'm a long time follower uh, since you were an observer, an uh program, and uh, just, you know, you are consciousness of Russia. And uh, while you're speaking like that, there is a faith <laughs> that things might turn out for the better eventually. So thank you um, so much, I, Barbara. Now I can see that you really, that I really have some readers. <laughs> <laughs> but of course you do. You we, we have my Greatly, we worry about you. And if you any at any time, sorry, I'm plugging in like that. In San Diego, we will host you. You know, we will open our doors to you. And sure. um, I love San Diego because San Diego is one of two zoos in the USA who have wombat. <laughs> wombat. Yeah, I mean, yeah animal. <laughs> wombat is my favorite <laughs> animal. I was visiting yeah. your wombat many times, and he loves me. <laughs> I just know mm. how difficult it is uh, to, you know, to live. Uh, it, it doesn't. In a foreign it, country, it, no, it's not difficult. No, no, you no. Know, I, uh, my problem is that when I'm exiles, when I'm in, when, when I feel anxiety, I can't write. Uh, when I feel fear, I also can't write. Uh, I am calm here. That's the reason. I'm not afraid of night rings, night bells, night knocks at the door. Yeah, yeah. I'm not okay. afraid of my neighbors uh, who are watching me anytime without any love. <laughs> That's the reason America is good for writing. All my recent novels, six of them, were written here because in Russia I was afraid. No. I have no uh, idea. I, wow. I, I printed them in Russia and <laughs> never read it because uh, uh, I was afraid to read it. Right. When I write here, I'm free. Totally understand. Well, if you if your stay is very extended, and again, uh, you know, you have an open invitation. Uh, and Thank you so much. I'll visit San Diego. You know, one principal thing. It's really important. Today, I had, I, had, I had meeting with uh, Mabel Brazen, who is uh -huh. one of my favorite explorers of Nazism. Her book on Mussolini influenced me greatly ten years ago, and she said. I never, I have never been in Russia. I've never been to Moscow. But um, most of people who live there say that they feel the horrifying pressure which is spread in the air. And visiting Hungary, just the west of east, the west of Eastern Europe, I felt that pressure. Even the air, even the sky was pressing me. Mm. It's, it, it can be explained. Maybe yeah. there's the hate or the weight of uh, 10 centuries of bloody history, but we also have them. But I think it is the pressure of modern situation. And maybe Hungary have lost it 
when they lost Soviet power. You know, in Russia, Soviet power was never finished. When Sholokhov was asked, what is the exact date of the final year of civil war? He said, it was never finished. <laughs> Our next spe uh, questioner is from Kiev, I believe. Mark Sinitsky? Uh, yes, I am from Kiev. And right now we have a seven. And I would like to ask you a question. Do you think that when a Yeltsin has died in 2007, this stuff has begun? So he was like feeling embarrassed of what Yeltsin would say about him. And what do you think Gorbachev would say about that? Well, Gorbachev now is 91. Uh, he knows and understands the situation, but he has no ability to move practically. Uh, he sits in the wheelchair and he has no tribune to express his opinion. He said uh, that he disliked the war. That's the only thing he said. Um, speaking about Yeltsin, you see, I felt a kind of sympathy for him. I felt sorry for him because I could see from the very close distance, being an active journalist at this time, how he was destroyed by the country. You know, when you are leader of the country, you repeat its uh, disorders. And he was destroyed by Russia. Uh, when he escaped from power, he became a health and a profound man. But being in power, uh, he was destroying every year himself. Not, not alcoholism was the reason of his destroying. Um, all the burdens, all the bandages of country uh, were laying on his shoulders. I never liked him. He was a typical Soviet politician, a, a typical party leader, but he had some human features. Sometimes he was candid. Sometimes he was kind. He wasn't cruel generally. Uh, he wasn't uh, such so fond of revenge like Putin, you know, Putin loves revenge only. And the most principal thing, Yeltsin liked himself. Putin dislikes himself, sure. He has such a very strong uh, feeling of his, I, I can't express it. He sees that he is not a chief, he's not a leader. He was not elected, he was given power. Yeah. And that's the reason he dislikes himself. I should say that governors and rulers can be only people who adore themselves, who never feel uh, invite, for example, to anybody because they're sure that they're better than everybody. That's the reason that, for example, I never fight against my uh, self-satisfaction. I like my books. I like my position. I like my wife. Um, I'm happy that I have my own life. I wouldn't change it for anything. And I must say that only such people can rule the countries. Only those who love themselves. Putin hates themselves. And his war is just the strict consequences, the mirror of his dislike to himself. Uh, I'm sorry, but Caligula left himself also. And no, you know, <laughs> no, you know that Caligula was sure uh, he wanted to be handsome and strong, and he had a uh, big tummy and thin legs. Well, that's the reason he disliked himself and always dreamed, oh, if Romanian people had only one neck to cut it. <laughs> that's the reason he was a hangman in his soul, and he hated mirrors. That's the reason there were no mirrors in his palace. There perhaps needs to be more mirrors for Putin. Uh, Vera Zibarova has a question. Vera? Hello. Hi. Hello. Actually, Vera is my, uh, Vera is my wife. Uh, my, Hi. My okay. <laughs> we, we see you okay. now. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm from Philadelphia and I have a couple questions. Uh, the first one is uh, not really important. Is, uh, uh, why Dmitry uh, thinks that uh, both Putin and uh, in the West uh, let that easy go, Anatoly Chubais. Uh, what what is he, what is his role in all that uh, uh, show for the for the last thirty years? Uh, what what is his role? Why is like uh, uh, Putin let him go? One West one West uh, don't san sanction him uh, him. 
I was well, like, uh, um, I know Chubais very well. I was interviewing him sometimes. He's a very smart person. I'm sure he's a secret ambassador of Putin, a secret ambassador who has any secret message for West. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not a conspirologist and don't believe in all those conspiracies, but I think Chubais is the only person from the big power, from the narrow circle, who can talk to be, uh, who can talk to Western leaders, and by the way, who has good English. Maybe <laughs> that's the only reason. He's a good talker, by the way. He, uh, he has the big experience of negotiations, and I think there was no other person to send him to the West. Mm -hmm. I'm going to move uh, us on because we have many people waiting to ask questions. No, no, the second question is welcome. I, I, I have a very important one about the Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, what, what's the role of the Russian Orthodox Church abroad? Not, not, not the Russian Orthodox Church inside. Uh, the, the, you know, the, there are a lot of uh, um, followers of the Russian Orthodox Church called from the white immigration. Uh, well, the, the, you they, know they, that some, yeah, sure. There are some support. churches, some churches who uh, come into Russian Orthodox Church abroad, refuse to be ruled by Russian patriarch. And so I think we're just now, we're just in the beginning of the long era of separation. I must say that Russian church would be separated into two or three parts, and that's normal because, you know, Russian church abroad never supported Stalin, for example, and did canonize Nicholas II. And there were very strong um, divisions between those two church. Putin tried to unify them. Uh, to unite them, but uh, there was no success on this way. And my hope, for example, is connected with those clericals, without um, those believers who never belong to official serfs of Orthodox Church. Maybe they will try to recreate it somehow. You know, there are many dissidents in church uh, who are well known in Russia. Uh, I could name them, I could enumerate them, but privately, not publicly because I don't want to make any harm for them. I'm quite sure that Russian Orthodox Church would be reformed radically, and maybe Russian Church abroad will help in this abyss also, in this, you. this catastrophe. Um, thank thank you. you very much. Eugenie you. from Mannheim. Hello, dear Dmitry Govich. Hello, Eugene. Very... I recognize you. Yes, okay. it is very good. It is very, very good to talk to you <clears throat> again and again. Yeah, it's again. pleasure. We'll see each other soon when we're in Moscow, I'm sure. I hope so. Mr. Uh, my question is about uh, function of Russia for the world. I know uh, uh, your opinion about the past role of our country for the world. What do you think about the future role uh, of Russia? for the world after all these events. Thank you so much. Zhenya, dear friend, it's really very difficult to predict. You see that Russia can cope with this challenge or can fail. Russia can be divided into many parts or can survive. Uh, everything depends. Everything can be decided in April. Uh, I believe that Russia, which will overcome Putin's spirit, will be a great example for the world. And one of my friends said, my only dream is to see the <coughs> Slavic Union between Navalny, Nemirovsky, and Zelensky. I also believe that young leaders will show great example and will forget Lukashenko and Putin as a nightmare. Uh, but you know, this chance is not so convictive, not so evident, like for example, all those restrictions now. You can't believe in it. You know, um, Putin said, oh, no, sorry, not Putin. Pushkin said, uh, <laughs> suffering is a good school, but happiness is university. I am sure that we'll come through this university. We'll get this university of happiness. <coughs> we'll get it very soon. Uh, but it's difficult to believe now, sure. You can say that I'm sitting in the safe New York and safe, safe Ithaca, but um, trust me, Russia is too big 
to be destroyed into parts. Russia is too big to be canceled. And Russia will show to the whole world the first good example in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank uh, you so Katja from Germany. Hello, everyone, and thank you for this great evening. Actually, I'm Russian originally. I live in Germany for many years now. So basically, the question that bothers me a lot is when Russian people will stop um, having this high level of chauvinism, the level of nationalism, because I think one of the key reasons why the war has started is because uh, Russian society, Russian people, <clears throat> also a lot of my friends and family in Russia, they consider themselves higher um, or superior like among other post-Soviet nations. Mm -hmm. So um, is it any chance that in the future um, this will stop and Russian people will consider themselves equal and not higher and not superior to other nations around them? Will Russian people be ever adult and mature? <laughs> Good question. Thank well, you. you see, um, Katya, you know, uh, Dostoevsky wrote that underground changes all your mind. Russia lives in underground for a very long time. Sure, underground is full of rats. Underground is full of scoundrels. And chauvinism or nationalism, as we know, is the best and the last shelter for scoundrel. Um, after underground will finish, after underground will be destroyed, after political life in Russia will, will be free and transparent, uh, nationalism and chauvinism will, will disappear rather soon. You know, chauvinism is the answer of pressed mind, of the mind which lives under pressure. Uh, that's a kind of self-hatred, which is put outside. Uh, most of Russians now hate themselves just because they understand that they haven't created a political nation. After political nation is created, after when political nation is created, you will see the new Russia and chauvinism would be destroyed immediately. You know, it's rather simple uh, to get rid of chauvinism because most of people like to be friendly, like to be good. In Russia now, there is a kind of competition. Who is the worst? As Maria Rosnova said, now Russia demonstrates to all the world the most horrifying competitions. You are bad, but I can't worse. I'm quite sure that people generally uh, want to be Christians. Uh, as Tertullian said, your soul is Christian for its nature. Most of people like to be kind and like to be friendly. They hate to hate. And those times of hatred, they will pass like a nightmare again, I repeat. So chauvinism can be one. Chauvinism is nothing more than a reaction of a long slavery, nothing more. This uh, chauvinism is maybe, uh, remember this um, phrase because this definition I think is very exact. Uh, nationalism is the only happiness of slave. I think that slavery will be one at last in Russia. Thank you. Um, you also can say that it's very simple to be optimist in Ithaca, yeah. uh, but trust me, Ithaca is not such a lovely place or um, the cold weather, much work and so on. Yes. We have just time, unfortunately, for one more question, Natalia. Two, two, oh please, oh two. I think we could take the, the next three, all okay. the people with their hands Thanks. raised. Let's Thanks. go for it. I would it. love to hear them, Natalia. Your sound isn't on. Yep. Hi. Hi. I doubt you recognize me. We met almost 40 years ago. You introduced me to Navella Matrieva one night. Very briefly, it was her husband's party. Um, I have, uh, I immigrated 30 years ago and all that land <clears throat> and its problems were a dark void, a kind of submerged into American problems. And that was, that was what I lived with. And only recently, because of this war, I had this awakening and a lot of confusing information. Um, what are the alternatives to Putin? Are there realistic alternatives? Some of the names and faces that I saw quite dark and very anti-democratic 
Um, I do not see anything that would be anyone who would be as competent as Nimtsov or um, anyone of that caliber. Or is there any option of smooth transition of power if that would be one of the scenarios? Who do you see as descendants, possible descendants of in different scenarios and the range of scenarios available? Well, Natasha, the most frightening idea is that everybody instead of Putin would do the same. Lushkov, Primakov, Nimtsov, any liberal, even Kakamada, you know, this position on the top of pyramid and the top of vertical uh, makes you crazy in the nearest uh, three years. It's evident. It's not a problem how to replace Putin. The problem is to destroy the system. Because um, as Navel Matveeva said, you know, I was her pupil in literature, said, even my cat, she had a cat, even my cat would get crazy taking such a non-limited power. That's the reason I restrict his rights. Uh, if, you allow some, if you allow somebody to do anything that's the closest, the uh, most, or maybe most, the, the simplest way to get a tyranny. And so, our task is to destroy the system of tyranny, not to replace Putin. Putin personally can be alive and safe or maybe uh, imprisoned in Haga. It's not, it's not personally significant. Uh, and he is not significant. Everybody at this place becomes the monster. Is there any realistic constructive force that can oppose the tyranny and replace, if not Putin, then tyranny? What is coming in the void if you, you know, I think the net of Navalny's followers, the horizontal net, not vertical, is a very good answer to Putin's pyramid. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. Lana? Lana. Is Lana there? Maybe Irina. Uh, hello. Oh, no. Hello, Lana. Uh, I have a question. Vladimir. Putin politely warned uh, those who have another citizenship uh, not to come back to Russia. He explained it because uh, those people already think like Western society and condemn the actions of Russia. Should we really warn about this? Or oh, I was a mistake. Well, being sincere, he hates foreigners. Uh, I think he hates them from the time of his work in Germany, where he was a very small officer on a very lousy work. I must say that those who immigrated are traitors for him. Uh, even his daughters who lived abroad for a long time, he disliked it. That's the reason, you know, most of Russians are quite sure that we're special and that, there, that we have nothing in common. We have no similarity with other people. Even the laws of physics, even biology of Russian peoples is another. They are aliens in the world. Uh, that's Putin's idea. And by the way, only this fact can explain that he is afraid so much of any biological explorations. He is sure that Slavics can be destroyed by some special biological arms. We're specialized people, we're angels. That's the reason he says they all go to hell and we to paradise. He is really sure that foreigners are aliens. That's his deep convictions. And you can't, for example, you can't uh, explain it to him because you know, most of Putin's supporters are anti-vaccinators. Um, it's clear because they're afraid of positive science. They're afraid of positivism. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, they're two mystical. More, two more questions, Irina. Thank you. Thank you, Lana. There is two Irinas. Which ones want to start? Irina Krene. Christina. Yes, me. Yeah, thank you. It's it's me. Yeah. So, um, hello everyone. Thank you for this wonderful meeting and admit to which um, oh, I'm worried about that Russian culture, Russian artists and painters, and uh, who is writing some novels and um, 
so really really worried and um i'm you said that you don't have now a fear to write something in us but what do you think what is going to happen soon back in russia so what their artists how they will uh, be able with this isolation with this in inability to reflect as an artist to do something and um, it could be very dangerous for a creator just in general so maybe you could give them some advice now how to work as an art and as, as an artist in such a um, difficult conditions so you know i will say a very strange thing yes but this time will be rather fruitful for writers first of all because they can see and uh, they can watch the uh rare and unpredictable things. They are now the watchers of great period of history, great events. That's the first reason. And then the second, you know, there is no fear in prison because you're already there. Uh, we could feel some fear when Russia was just transforming into prison and there were some rests of freedom. Now, when Russia becomes a concentration camp, most of people living abroad or living in it have no illusions. And the absence of illusions is the best ground for writing. The best way of writing will get great literature now because it will be written not for publications, not for some literary awards, but for the future reader who is the best reader. Yep. We'll get great literature very soon. You know, the most dangerous thing is not that censorship, but self-censorship. Now self-censorship finished. Thank you. And our last question from Irena. Uh, we need your sound. Yes, we need your sound, please. Irena Esanovsky, yeah. Irena, we need your sound. Can, can you hear me? Yes, now, yes. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for giving me this uh, last minute. Mm -hmm. I have more specific question. Um, I was admiring your educational work with um, children and teenagers, and I was doing this from afar. And uh, just before you left the United States, actually, my niece from St. Petersburg, she won some kind of a set competition that you announced and you invited her for your seminar for young writers. So she she came back very inspired, you know, and full of plans. Uh, uh, and uh, she she was considering at that point, like uh, going to jur journalist uh, department at uh, the State University in Saint Petersburg. I remember, yeah. Yeah, and I was trying to explain to her that maybe in the condition that are now in Russia, it's not a good choice. There will be nothing to write about. So for young people like her and others who you know, and you were praising them, saying that they're very talented and smart and have a great future, what, what should I say to her and what would you say to kids who are in this situation right now. Well, you know, it's difficult to give such advices because today Olga Baulina, a young journalist, was killed by bomb, by Russian bomb in Kyiv. She was a reporter. Uh, I knew her and most of Russian journalists knew her. She was charming and very young and talented. And she was killed. Uh, so how can I give such advices? But I must say that journalism is the best way for a young person to watch the world to see the events, to participate in them. And by the way, there's the best school for writer because you should be interesting. And mm -hmm. journalists can be boring. So uh, maybe in two or three years, this profession will be back to Russia. Okay. Okay, Thank I'm on my... Much. Okay, and I'm on my side. We'll try to bring her here <laughs> if I can. I'm sure. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. There's, there's much work As for me, done. I'll try to I'll try to write a good novel for teenagers. That's my topic now okay. because teenagers is the main audience now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And Dimitri, thank your you, next Barbara, novel. and thank everybody for participation, yeah. attention, activity, and so on. I'm very happy to see all of you. Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, I, I just want to say that Dimitri does have one novel, Living Souls, that's been translated into English, but the novel that he'll be working on, hopefully while he's here, will be written in English. In English. Yeah. yeah, 
Yeah. Um, I want to thank everyone for listening in tonight and especially for these excellent questions you brought us. And I personally want to thank Dimitri for his powerful work, for his generosity in sharing all his experience and thoughts. Thank you all in Ithaca. And his persistence uh, and what you call your service. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. We all benefit. Thank you so thank much. You so Thanks much. to all Bye. of you.